I start from the presumption that our achievement gaps are unacceptable and that our existing structure is not meeting the needs of all of our children. Our students, when they come to us, we give them uh, diagnostic tests in reading and math. If they're on average two years below grade level, I think that's uh, representative of where most New Haven students are, as an average. <laughs> What caught everybody's attention about Amistad is that you had New Haven kids basically scoring as well as, as kids in, in, in Greenwich, um, in some of the, the wealthiest suburbs in the state. They are intelligent, caring, loving, and most importantly, they are family. Ladies and gentlemen, take a look at our beautiful eighth grade. This program has been funded by the Hickory Foundation, the Smith Richardson Foundation, the U.S. Department of Education, the San Francisco Foundation, the A.P. Kirby Jr. Foundation, Inc., and the Pisces Foundation. You probably wouldn't guess from looking at this bright bunch of youngsters just how much brighter their future has become. Welcome to graduation at Amistad Academy, a charter school that serves mostly black and Latino kids in grades five through eight in New Haven, Connecticut. They enter Amistad on average more than two years below grade level. But by the time they leave here, most of these urban kids are doing as well or better than their suburban counterparts. It's a great success story that's offering new hope for kids who need it the most. Hello, I'm Clarence Page. Our subject is one of America's biggest challenges. How do we close the persistent achievement gap between black students and white students? It's a very important question. But up until now, Americans have been reluctant to ask it, and the gap persists. Do we have any good model schools that have closed the gap? The answer is, yes, we do. One of them is right here in New Haven, a public charter school called Amistad Academy. While most of Connecticut's black public school students lag far behind their white counterparts, the black students here at Amistad are virtually even. And in writing, Amistad actually beat the state's average. How does Amistad do it? With good old-fashioned values. Instead of lowering standards, Amistad raised them. Instead of settling for merely good work, Amistad called for excellence and the students answered the call. Over the next hour, we'll see how Amistad did it, and more important, how other public schools can do it too. Christopher Jenks is a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He's written extensively on the black-white test score gap. Why have you and other social scientists uh, decided to give so much attention to it? Well, I think the reasons that the social scientists have given a lot of attention to it have a lot to do with the fact that we figured out that the test score gap played a very large role in explaining why it was that African Americans weren't graduating from college at the same rate as whites and, and why the wage gap persists despite all kinds of things that we have tried to do about that. Those disparities almost disappear once you compare African Americans and whites who actually have the same test scores. So if you could narrow that test score gap, you might be able to do an awful lot economically and educationally besides just deal with the test scores. When I go to Amistad Academy, I see young people in uniforms. They've got special binders. Uh, they got a long school day. Uh, I see uh, teachers and students working closely together. Uh, what difference do these factors make? Is this a lot of show, or do you think it's really making a difference? What they're doing is sending a message to these kids that this school is different from the one you were in before. This is a break with the past. These are kids who come in, they're not doing so well, and they're being told, okay, 
this is going to be someplace different. Um, we're going to ask more of you. You're going to do more. And a lot of these things are signals about, you know, this is not um, like the elementary school you went to. This is not like um, what is often a chaotic um, street and home environment and so forth. This is going to be quiet. It's going to be orderly. It's going to be well organized. Say again? Little. Little? You see these two tables right here? All right. Let's try to find you on the fifth grade list. Good morning. I'm glad you're with us again this year. Good. Good. The white t-shirts on these fifth graders indicate they are first year students. As such, they're about to sign a contract. They promise to live up to Amistad's academic standards and social rules. In return, they get to move up from their white t-shirts to a blue Amistad shirt, their first step into their new commitment. What a great way for us to welcome our new fifth graders. We are very excited to have you with us. And this is our opportunity as a community to come together and welcome you to our community. So you will be hearing quickly from a few Amistad students who have some words of wisdom and advice for you. So fifth graders especially, listen up. Welcome all new students. My name is Bernard Gare and I am in the seventh grade. I will be explaining the contract you're about to sign. The reason why Amistad has a contract is so that you know what you're responsible for. It's pretty simple. You need to live up to our reach values, respect, enthusiasm, achievement, citizenship, and hard work. When you make your commitment to reach, you will be able to receive an Amistad shirt. This shirt means that you you will show the reach values 24-7. You have all signed your contracts. You are committing your name. In that contract, you pledge to live up to the reach values, to do your homework, top quality, complete, on time, each and every night, to show up to school every day, on time, and to do everything it takes to be your absolute best. The moment you put on that shirt, you become an Amistad Academy student. As Joshua told you, we wear our shirts with pride. So at this time, I would like to invite you to put on your shirts. Amistad Academy tries to create a culture of achievement, both academically and socially. That's the message these fifth graders are hearing as they learn about their new life at Amistad and pledge to follow the school's values called REACH, which stands for respect, enthusiasm, achievement, citizenship, and hard work. When we move from one class to another in the halls, or when we move from breakfast to our classroom, we always walk in a line, and we're always going to walk in the same order, all right? Ms. Walling and I have made up an order for you to stand in, and line up on this blue line. Life at Amistad is very structured, with high expectations and a relentless focus on the basics. When you're walking, do not touch anyone, and do not talk. Alexandra is the first person in line. She's going to hold the door. Class structure is consciously built starting with simple classroom behaviors. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Students are taught how to walk in the halls, how to hold doors for their fellow students, how to pay attention in class, and when necessary, how they will be punished. My first reaction to walking in the hallways is like, oh my gosh, like at my old school, we actually didn't have to do this, so what is going on here? So it was actually like a big change, and I was like, we have to be quiet when we walk in the hallways. But then it actually got very good, because I actually realized what the system was for and how it made the school better. This is how I expect that you will come into school every morning, is just this quietly, without talking to anyone, without disrupting anyone, doing a beautiful, beautiful job. The rules that they had here, mandatory rules, I took them like, like something I had to um, do to be better in the school. 
it's not really a struggle once you get to know them, but it's a struggle once you um, once they first tell you you have to get out your old customs and deal with um, new lines, organized binders, homework folders, getting them signed. We expect you to follow directions the first time. We expect you to walk quietly in line. You're sitting up straight and you're facing forward. Good, looks good. A special emphasis is placed on the REACH values, the five values that govern Amistad life. When I came to Amistad Academy in the sixth grade, it was hard because they wanted higher standards than my old school. And like that, we had to live up to REACH values in Amistad, but in the old school, they didn't mind how we really acted. So I had to get adjusted to um, showing respect, enthusiasm, achievement, citizenship, and hard work for the whole year. Which REACH values did you violate? This means, what was I not doing? Was I being respectful? Theodore Sergi served as the Commissioner of Education for the state of Connecticut. I start from the presumption uh, that our achievement gaps are unacceptable and that our existing structure is not meeting the needs of all of our children. If you buy that, if you sort of have an acceptance of this thing we might call poor performance or less than the, the performance we would like for every child, then you need some new structures. You need to do some things differently. Serving about 250 students in grades 5 through 8, Amistad was founded in 1999. That was when a group of Yale Law students enlisted local business and community leaders behind a new idea for a new kind of school. With proper support inside and outside the classroom, the law students said, low-income students in the city could perform just as well as better-off students in the suburbs. That was the dream. Well, when we set out to found Amistad, I think I in particular brought a fair amount of humility to it, not being a career educator. Um, and so what we did was we ran around the country, in fact, winning as, as far away as Calgary, Canada, um, to look at best practices. We did not uh, bring any arrogance to it. We did not bring any divine insight to it. We needed to know what were other schools doing working with similar populations to the one we wanted to work with, um, but achieving dramatically different results. It may surprise you to hear that Amistad models its teaching structure after a small private school in faraway Calgary, Canada. A private school for white students in Canada might seem like an odd model for a public school for black and Latino youngsters in New Haven, but one of Amistad's founders, Desha Toll, explains how that works. When you go there, what amazed me in terms of being a private, white, um, special education school in Canada, one might be immediately struck by the differences between that context and us in you know, urban America, New Haven, Connecticut. And however, what you see upon, you know, in talking with the people there and upon really taking a look at their program is that the instructional truths uh, are transcendent, at least the instructional strategies are transcendent. They have, and we have, in many respects, a similar mission. They work with a population that comes to them in general years below grade level, as do we. Uh, we met with the co-founders of the school uh, about a year before it opened and shared with them uh, the process that we had gone through to initiate uh, our, our school 20 years ago. Uh, what we looked at was how were we going to replicate the success that we'd had in this environment in their context. That involved the development of a specific training program for new staff members. And the goal when we developed the program was to walk them through all the things that you need to do to deliver instruction in terms of reading, writing, and arithmetic, as well as develop the culture that you want within your environment. In our first year, they did all of our teacher training. By our second year, we shared the teacher training. And now we're at the stage where it's really Amistad staff that is training new Amistad staff, as appropriately as it should be. Our ideal way of bringing on a new teacher is to have them spend the summer with us. First, there's a full week of training, sort of an amistadization in some respects. And then that's followed by three weeks of actually teaching in our summer school. The most valuable professional development for teachers is actually being in the back of their room and providing them with feedback on that lesson, being in their context, seeing what the issues they're dealing with, and coaching them as individuals. 
This concentration on teacher training really has one aim, and that's to get all the teachers on the same page, so they all have a similar teaching approach with their kids. I'm basically going to pretend that this is the first day of class. And so part of what you're going to do on the first day is go through this system with your kids. Next one. It is this school-wide emphasis on a consistent lesson plan format, coupled with Calgary's periodic assessments, that set Amistad apart from many schools. If they know that their reading teacher and their writing teacher and their math teacher are going to have the same sort of general classroom expectations, meaning, you know, you're not just going to shout out an answer, you're going to raise your hand, um, you're going to, you know, have this set procedure for how we get into groups. I mean, if the, the more you can have things done in a similar way, the more it, it sticks for the kids, but also it eliminates confusion and opportunities for, you know, kids to maybe get off task and do some things that necessarily aren't you know, aren't in their best interest or the best interest of the people around them. At Amistad Academy, we do a lot of work with the kids around their academic organization. And the belief is that those are just skills that set them up for so much success. Well, the binders and folders, they help me get organized because you know where everything's at. And if something is due tomorrow, you know exactly where it's at and, and when you can do it. And like you, time management, they always telling me in high school that you have to have time management. All your papers go back into your green folders. Team leaders, pick them up and put them away. Everybody else, put your binders up. Show me the Those strategies here. we found are just as important, and so we teach them how to organize their binder. We teach them how to write down the homework from the night before. As silly as that sounds, a lot of our fifth graders come in and don't really understand. When the teacher puts the homework on the board, what do you do then? And so we teach them that, teach them where to put their homework, how to do that, how to label a paper with your name and date on the upper right-hand corner. There's all sorts of things like that that are important that if kids can get that, then they're ready for high school, um, then they're ready for college. All our classes also start in the same way. We have five quick review, what we call quick questions. Can okay, we have the five quick questions that are on the front board. Everybody turn to your quick questions. Hey, quick questions. Your binders should be out and you should be starting your quick questions are on the board. You only have about five of them. You give kids about five minutes to do them. And the purpose of them is to review. And the whole lesson plan is basically about review because you want them to have success at the beginning of class. Don't know where you are. It's designed, they get four out of five right, so they're getting 80 to 100% right every day. So they feel confident and they're reviewing. Where was the final trial of the Amistad case? Alex? Washington. Washington. D.C. Thank you. Basically, it's split. The first half of the class is review, and the second half you'll go into your new material for the day. And then at the end, you do what's called independent practice. And the independent practice is letting them go on their own, using their notes if they need to, but to practice what they just learned. And then lastly, you have what is your, your, your summary or journal writing or something like that. And then the last thing is to make sure that they get their homework. And homework is always, well, it's tr we try to make sure that homework is always based on something they already know so again they can have success because the job of homework shouldn't be to go home and have to have 50 people help me with my homework. The job should be homework reinforcing something I already know. For example, if I introduced a concept on Monday, they probably wouldn't have it actually on their homework until maybe Wednesday or Thursday until I'm certain that almost everyone in the classroom, you know, has been trying their hardest and knows how to do it. Thank you. You're welcome. It's a very strong form of communication as to what the child's responsible for that night. So the child comes in the next day on the bus, all their homework's supposed to be complete. It's all supposed to be in one section of the homework folder. They put that homework folder immediately when they come into a bin, and that's brought up to their classroom, and then they have uh, a teacher or students will go through and check off whether the homework is done. We're giving them homework that they know how to do. A lot of homework problem can be the kid doesn't know how to do it. We send kids home with work they know how to do for home, and then we start every class with stuff they know how to do. So we start and end class, if you think of the beginning and homework, with confident cumulative review building, and then sandwich that with really clearly modeled new material, and that is what we've really gained a power from Calgary with. Patricia Lucan is the president of the New Haven Federation of Teachers. Uh, we need to uh, differentiate between the district public schools and Amistad, which is a public school, but does work differently. And it works differently in its school day, the length of its day, for one thing. It works differently in the fact that its teachers are not 
a part of the bargaining unit, which is the New Haven Federation of Teachers. It works differently in that it can set certain parameters uh, for ch children's behavior and expectations, and it can insist on them. If she kicks you off the bus, indefinitely, because it's not the first time that you've been kicked off the bus. Once a student's behavior violates the REACH values, the Dean of Students, Jose Peralta, works with teachers, parents, and students to resolve the issue. Sometimes students are sent down to my office for fighting, putting their hands on another student, being disrespectful to a teacher, calling a teacher a bad word, a bad name, you know, causing a ruckus, being disruptive. I also see a lot of like low-level infractions of the REACH values. And it's not because you can't do the work, it's because you're not doing the work. Punishment at Amistad is all about opening up a dialogue. To get to the root of the problems, Jose Peralta talks to as many teachers and others as possible. Small infractions tend to become larger problems if left unchecked. So the idea here is to address them early. He came with this to detention. Yeah. Any small thing that's left untouched, you know, for example, the simple thing of not tucking your shirt in, if we leave it unaddressed, then that sloppiness transcends into, I'm not going to take pride in my work, I'm not going to take pride in this, I'm not going to take pride in that. Is your, is your shirt tucked in? Double check. We try to address it from many different angles. And it's all about routines, setting standards, setting expectations. This is what we want from you, this is why we want it from you, and having that, that sense of buy-in from the students. Barbara Carroll is a social worker on the Amistad staff. When a kid is acting up here, we really look into what's going on with that student. I mean, certainly the behavior is unacceptable, and they get that message that that's inappropriate, unacceptable behavior. But then between Jose and I, um, I think that we really try to figure out what's, what's is really going on for this student. I mean, what really made them angry, or what really made them act out um, so strongly, and try to help them negotiate their relationships better. Can you say those feelings out loud? Feelings are angry, frustrated, sadness, confused, boredom, I don't care attitude. Right. Which one do you usually have? Frustrated and don't care attitude. Right. Kids are feeling angry. They feel like people, you know, teachers are picking on them. Things are not fair. There's a, a real sense of, of what's fair and not fair and what's just and not just to these students. Having students look at how their behavior affects other people is a crucial piece in helping them um, figure out how to get along with other people. I used to be, like, let's just say, not the perfect student in the fifth grade, and I have the teachers, um, the principal, Ms. Toll, Ms. McCurry, and my teacher, and some of my friends, too, has helped me. Like, my behavior has changed. Like, the attitude has really gone down. Now I'm, like, used to helping my friends so they could get up to where I'm at. Before I came to Amistad Academy, I was, like, the person that nobody wants to be around. Like, they will talk about me, and then I'll go up to them, I'll confront them, and I'll get in a big old argument and end up getting in trouble. But ever since I've been at Amistad, um, I've calmed down a little bit, and um, Second Step helped me, too. I'm going to ask you to answer a question on the piece of paper, and this is the question. What are some things that make you angry? The school has invested a lot in this program called the Second Step, which is an anger management violence prevention program. Twice a week, every advisory group for about 35 minutes has time to teach this. And it talks about uh, impulse control, empathy, anger management. And now that you know how to recognize them, what do you do instead of hauling off and hitting someone square in the jaw or something like that? Each lesson is broken down in terms of classroom behavior that can be monitored both from you know, a peer angle, almost like a peer monitoring group, as well as in an individual person working on things. And I think a lot of the students here, especially in the fifth grade I've noticed this year, don't have a clue about sometimes when they're angry, how they hurt others or how they you know, kind of put that negative energy out there. When you take your book and your pencil, take your pencil with you and go to the timeout desk and you may leave your book there. I'm gonna set three minutes on my timer and in three minutes I'll check in with you. I appreciate how everybody else is still working. Teachers also have ways to deal with behavior issues within their classes. 
The main objective is to get the students to become self-reflective. Time out, there's a desk and a sheet that students fill out which ask questions about which reach value did you violate, what was the situation that got you upset, what are you going to do in the future, what are three options that you can choose from to do it differently and be more successful. And you're going to treat your classmates the way they wish to be treated. Excellent. Do you feel like you're ready to sit back down again? Yes. Very good. I'm going to keep this. Some students that I know can get to that point, but it takes time for them to learn to do that. Because I don't think that typically we ask people to do that in our society. You know, it's, we blame others for our own behavior. All of Amistad's students are chosen through the same lottery system as other public schools in New Haven. That means Amistad cannot skim high achievers. It has the same student mix as any other New Haven school. But as a charter school, Amistad's administrators and teachers have a lot more freedom to decide how to structure their school day, which, by the way, runs from 8 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon. Every day begins with the morning circle, a time to reinforce Amistad's ideas about community. Misdeeds are apologized for, and outstanding achievement is recognized in a public way. I thought Morning Circle was um, a pretty good concept because it brought everyone in the school together just to share what's, ha what's going around in the school. For example, kids get recognized for good things that they did and um, teachers can announce things. I would like to recognize Ari. She got the correct answer in math and she was the first. She wasn't bragging. I think that shows respect, enthusiasm, and citizenship. You recognizing a student for showing the reach values or showing a particular reach value. And then also you have apologies for being late or if you're suspended for any reason, then you apologize for that. I apologize to the community for being late. At Amistad, the day is structured like this. In the morning, when the school hopes the students' minds will be fresh, they spend two hours on reading, plus an hour on math, and another hour on writing. Focusing more time on core skills helps students who are behind in those areas to catch up. Part one, UN makes the sound un. What sound? Un. First word, what word? Unreal. Next, what sound? E. What word? Easy. Daisha gave me an opportunity to think about what works, what doesn't work, adjust to fit the students' needs, and at the end of the day, I think what um, the school is most concerned about is the outcome. You know, are students becoming better readers in the process? Are they becoming better thinkers? Are they becoming, uh, you know, lifelong learners? You're going to see if you can meet your goal of reading 240 words in two minutes without making more than five errors. Decoding class is simply about can you decode these words. In some ways that's the initial step of reading is the children really need to understand how letters and sounds come together. Now once they have that or as they're, as they're mastering that there has to be meaning to these words. So now we're focusing on building both in pretty reluctant readers. The big red You will probably be tired from climbing 20 flights. Oh, just stop. I mean, one word ahead of 40. Count yeah. the words and make sure. How, raise your hand quickly if, you're, if the person who was reading made it to their goal. Everybody take your junior grade books, come over to the reading corner. Before I can even say, get your books and let's go to the reading corner, they're already over there. They're always eager to, to do their read aloud for that 20 minutes. And 
I start them off, I read a paragraph, and they basically take it from there. It's, it's, it's a student-run activity. Never anymore whistling among out of sight overhead. And they know that if they died or a cow died, that that kite will sweep down in the next kite. Before this, I never really cared about reading, and now I like, love to read books all the time. I'm like reading, and my friends are like, why are you always reading books? And I'm like, I don't know, I just like to. The other public school, it never was an issue that they had to read, which is important for kids to read. So in Amistad, you must read. Every night, you must read. Even the weekend, you have to read, and you, I have to sign the folder. Hold on, Alex. In my writing class, we apply a lot of the concepts that we learn in reading class. They make that connection between what they read and, and what they write. A lot of times students will come up to me and ask me how do they uh, write something correctly and I'll just usually say well we've read this this morning and it's the same example it's very similar go back to your uh, novel and take a look and that light comes on where they go oh <laughs> The last 70 minutes of the school day is devoted to classes that feed the students' creative side. Music, sports, art, computer sciences. We've really been able to design the program the way we want, and that also allows us to be able to really focus on their core skills, but also have an enrichment program from four to five where they have arts and, and music and all those things that are getting cut in some other schools. Amistad expects commitment from parents, too. Parents are asked to sign a contract, just like students do, as a symbol of that commitment. This triangular support system, parents, students, and teachers, is bound together by mutual agreement to support each other in a variety of ways. For one, it means parents are kept informed and involved with what's going on in the classroom from day one. Check around. We decided to have a series of orientations. We felt like if we started with parents from the beginning, helping them to understand our mission, then we would have a lot more success academically with the students. We don't want this to be a time where you all just come and listen to people just talk to you. We want to learn about you also. Getting the parents to buy into the mission was a good thing because they understood from the beginning, please don't be angry okay. when the kids come home with tons of homework. And please don't be angry you know, that we have the expectation that they do it. And if they don't, then they're going to get in trouble. Please don't be angry that the day is very long and we have no intention on changing that because there's a reason, you know, there's a reason for everything. So, you know, just all of those sort of hard questions that parents might have had, all of those things were answered. What we were trying to do was to make parents feel like they could be a part in what their kids were doing because we gave them the tools in order to make that happen. You are not just signing your kid up for the school, you are signing up. I think many of our parents are genuinely supportive. I think it runs a wide spectrum and there are some parents who are super involved uh, and they consistently go the extra mile for their child and for the school as a whole. You are making a commitment to 15 volunteer hours at the school. Before that gets too scary, PTO meetings count, Report card night counts. All of the parent night activities we have count. There are a lot more that are quietly supportive. And there are a handful that are not supportive. Um, and you frequently see that coming out when there are discipline decisions that have to be made um, or where we're really trying to kind of ratchet a student up in terms of commitment, whether it's homework or attendance. Um, and in those situations, it is really tough. And we do try to bring that parent on board. Uh, I think we spend a lot of time talking with parents about why, why we make certain decisions, why we're asking for certain kinds of commitments from them or from their child. Frequent meetings help keep parents informed about their child's education. It's part of the contract. Parents are told how the day will look for their child, what the homework folder looks like, how you check it, and sign off on its completion. And these are the REACH ethics that each and every member of the Amistad community will aspire to live towards. The contract serves two purposes. One, to get the family involved in the school, okay, in their child's learning experiences, but also as a way to tie the parent to the school. 
you know, and, and have the, the parent be a part of the whole education process that the child is about to enter into. I like the fact that Amistad Academy offered the contract because it made all parties accountable for the success of the student. Um, you had to sign a contract as a parent saying that you had to sign the homework folder every night. That made you accountable. Uh, it also, like Jonathan said, it also made you involved as a parent because you had to go through their homework. So it kind of made you involved in getting to know what they were learning in their classroom on a daily basis. If the homework comes in and it's not, I, you know, I've had this in the past where the paper may be crumbled, it may have some stains on it, it may have this and that, that is not acceptable. That homework assignment will be redone during lunchtime. Um, so again, these are just habits that I think we're trying to build, you know, positive citizens who are responsible to their community, who are responsible to themselves. And a lot of these routines, we are just trying to instill that this is the way they need to be as students. So this is accountability both on the child, on my part, and then on your part to read the homework assignment and then do it. And then every single night, Students are responsible for reading at least 20 minutes a night. And that is just something that they have found research after research shows that children become better readers by reading. First we do independent reading at home for 20 minutes. Then after that, we will write down how many pages, what page we start and how many pages we read and the title of the book. And then we will we have um, what's called a reading lock and we will write some two, one or two sentences about the story. She wasn't doing too good in reading, so by reading 20 minutes every day, it helps her. It helps her improve in you know, the skills and languages, how she speaks and stuff, so I like that very much. You want to start responding? The smaller school also helps to foster more personal relationships between the teachers and the student's family. At Amistad, keeping parents informed about student growth is essential. When I see a problem with a student um, who I have this much respect for um, and with whom I have a relationship with the family, it is absolutely critical to me to feel that I have brought to your attention um, whatever news may not be conveyed to you by other teachers who don't know him as well. You know, in a regular school environment, you would only interact with a child about seven hours a day. We interact with these children about ten hours a day and in many cases much more. Um, as a result, we get to know the parents and, you know, the entire family much more intimately than we would in a typical situation. I had conversations with the science teacher uh, earlier on in the trimester since I was in the position of checking up on you, um, in which the news wasn't so good. I had turned to the wrong friend and they were leading me astray. And so she was, she was pounding me in on being good and um, behavior wise in class because I was distracted and I mean and I was distracted by others and it showed in my grades and during that conference she tried to tell me that I have to change either I go towards negative or I can go positive. There is a percentage of our parents who still are not convinced that we are here um, for all of the right reasons um, and that um, we have the experience and expertise to be making the very best decisions on behalf of their children. Um, I think that confidence grows on an almost daily basis. We recently completed a multi-year study of our charter schools and our regional magnet schools and parents and students are very satisfied. They return year after year. They speak highly of the place. They, they know the principal. They know the teachers. They feel that the school knows their child and they communicate more regularly. Um, now, in a critical way, there are those who would say, well, it's easy. If you only have 100 to 200 students, you can do a lot more than when you have 1,000. Maybe that tells us that we have to start to do more to break up our large schools. Um, now that raises all kinds of problems for people when they think about the expense of building a whole bunch of other buildings, but maybe there's more we can do within our large facilities to get to that very personal approach that's so desperately needed at that age and particularly with youngsters who haven't been successful and may not have as much support in their homes and from their family. 
Every two years, beginning with the fourth grade, the state administers what's called the Connecticut Mastery Test, or CMT, to monitor student progress. In addition to that test, Amistad administers its own test every six weeks. It's called the Curriculum Based Measurements, or CBM. Frequent testing enables teachers to closely monitor student progress and respond to problems before students fall behind. All right, does everybody have their test? Nope. The state of Connecticut says there are 55 or so discrete things that kids should be able to do. And we've taken those and said, okay, if this is what they need to do by the end of the year, six weeks, they should be here. The next six weeks, they should be here, 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 and here. And so we give these assessments um, to make sure that the kids are mastering what they need to master. Because the worst thing that can happen it's okay, we tested them here, and we tested them here. They didn't know it there, and they still don't know it there. That's not helpful for me. What's helpful for me as a school administrator, and what's helpful, I think, for teachers, is to use that information to guide instruction. So what we do when we find out the kids don't know it here, we try to figure out what can we do. The teachers correct it and kind of look at the results, kind of say, oh, well, it looks like, you know, maybe they didn't necessarily get I don't know if we're talking about reading, finding the main idea, but they did get these things about characters. So maybe for the next six weeks I can continue to focus a little bit on finding the main idea, but I don't have to spend so much time on characterization or whatever. And so it helps the teacher really focus his or her time and attention on the areas that the kids have shown to be a little weaker in. Oh, you brought the actual test too, good. One of the things we try to do every six weeks is see which kids got it right, which kids got it wrong. What has my class mastered? I could just immediately incorporate and review it all year. What did only a few kids miss, but enough that I want to attack it as a group? And then the follow-up question being, what kids are falling through the cracks? If I see one kid missing all across the board, what interventions do I need to do? Do I need extra tutoring? Does he need to come in the morning, et cetera? Another goal of these six-week assessments is to help the kids alleviate anxiety, build self-esteem, and become familiar with test taking. So when they sit down to take the Connecticut Mastery Test, they have much more confidence. Natalie Misakian has been covering educational issues, including Amistad Academy, for the New Haven Register since the mid-1990s. Amistad is a school where the majority of the kids are minorities. The majority of kids are living in poverty. Um, they, most of them, all of them come from New Haven, and those are groups of kids that have tended historically to score far below the state average on the Connecticut Mastery Test. And what caught everybody's attention about Amistad is that they, they sort of bucked that. They shattered that idea that these kids can't do well on these tests. Um, they, they're doing it, and they, they, they did it in, in a matter of a few years, not a matter of a decade. Um, so I think what, you know, I, I don't know if they can copy that in another school, but um, I think that it makes it more difficult for educators to sort of say that it, it's out of our hands and that, you know, we can't, you know, we can't do more than we're doing. I think Amistad proved that it, it can ha you know, that it can be done. Improvements for students at Amistad have been nothing short of dramatic compared to their peers citywide or statewide. In math scores, for example, there was almost no change from sixth grade to eighth grade for New Haven or Connecticut students 